This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Of Silent Voices. Today we have the story of Sharon Cole and her children as well as Dr. Carol Kramer who worked with the children. I want to thank you ladies for coming to the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So what exactly happened that made you that caused you to realize there was an issue with your children and what was going on? Uh, my daughter disclosed that um, her dad sexually abused her um, I had gone to a Steuben Review, Steubenville <laughs> youth retreat with my oldest daughter, and we were gone all weekend. And the three children, um, two or uh, three, four, and seven, were with my husband at the time, their father. Um, when we got back on Monday, um, my daughter disclosed to three that um, her daddy had cut her in the private with a knife or whatever. That's okay, take your time. She, um, just <laughs> when she was examined at the Children's Assessment Center by the doctor down there, he said that she um, had a vaginal lesion from the top of her vagina to the bottom and that she had bled profusely and it would have bled for a long time and it would have been very painful. Um, the abuse was witnessed by her four-year-old sister and seven-year-old brother. Um. <laughs> What's, at that point, what steps did you take to protect your children? I mean, at that point you knew something bad was going on. So, um, any parent would be concerned and want to do what they could to keep them safe. So. Oh, I was told to go home and wait for DHS to contact me. So the authorities weren't called, which should have been called right during that investigation, right when she disclosed to the doctor what dad did. And it was, I mean, the same disclosure at St. Mary's Emergency, it was the same disclosure to myself, it was the same disclosure to uh, pediatricians, same disclosure to Dr. Carol Kramer. Um, so the examining doctor, the disclosure to him, immediately the authority should have been brought in. Um, he should have been picked up. He should have whatever the process for the, you know, somebody that sexually abused a child. And instead, um, I didn't even hear from DHS for almost a week and I had to contact them myself. Um, the authorities weren't even brought in until like two weeks later um, when we found, you know, the blood on the mattress, uh, blood stained under underwear. Um, I, a week, over a week of calling detective and explaining, you know, we have this evidence and, you know, a DHS not even coming in for the full week afterwards. Yeah, but you did take her to a forensic interview and that. Oh, yeah, we took happened. her. I took her wherever I could take her to get. Dr. Carol Kramer to the pediatricians to um, therapists. So, just to ask you, what was your conclusion, and what what did um, the children talk to you about at that time? Oh, the children. Each one came in. Well, of the two, the three came in, and uh, Ab, oops, the child, the, the little girl, uh, was first. Who, the child who had been sexually abused, and she said um, exactly what had happened in detail. Mm -hmm. And she told me that they had gone to the doctor that night yet, 
and that the doctor had taken pictures and um, and he that he understood that she had been hurt and cut with a knife and then I talked with her sister who was a year older who said the same thing then I talked with a little brother and even though he was seven at the time he did not disclose anything he said he had he was in the other room watching TV and he had heard nothing and seen nothing and having taught school third grade fourth grade <laughs> um, before I became a therapist I was a school teacher and I knew from his motions and his words that he most likely had seen something but he wasn't ready to disclose and I knew if he ever got comfortable enough he would tell me what had happened which he did do somewhat later not that day in fact it was maybe a couple of months later right in fact he drew a picture of what had happened what he saw and okay. the right the when the examination um, not only were the pictures taken but the doctor said that it had happened within the last 48 hours which was the time when he was the only one that was with the children and they had asked him um, later which showed up in a report if um, my daughter had fallen or injured herself in any way and he said no absolutely not she did not fall she did not injure herself so how do you explain <coughs> not only your daughter disclosing that you know daddy opened it and he had a knife but that she had a vaginal lesion that it was right that yeah that's not involved. something that right is real common now just for our viewers because you know we've talked a little bit and I got to know you guys a little bit mm -hmm. but can you tell our viewers what um, your education is and what you've been trained in oh well um, after undergrad I got a free ride to the University of Michigan and I was trained in school social work but in those years you had to have taught five years in the classroom Okay. then go back and get your degree in school social work which I got uh, my master's in school social work uh, then I worked for a number of years as a school social worker and probably 15 or 16 and I decided to become a clinical social worker uh, so I went back to Grand Valley and got my degree in clinical social work and then I decided to get my doctorate, so I went to um, Holy Cross College and got my doc doctorate in marriage and the family. So I ended up being licensed, a licensed teacher. I still am licensed as a teacher, permanent license from back then. And I'm licensed as a marriage and family counselor. In fact, I served on the board appointed by Governor Blanchard way back when as a marriage and family counselor for the state um, board. And uh, then I'm a licensed in MSW clinical social worker, but I also have licenses in addictions, um, uh, forensic counseling, um, and just many other licenses that you pick up along the way. But I am especially interested in um, children and families where sexual abuse has occurred because I see the devastation to everyone yeah most definitely long term <clears throat> there's a lot of people that are social workers with no training as we discussed so I just want right. to make sure that our viewers know that this is um, actual training that you've had with yes. children and with families well that's true because as I was working on behalf of uh, her family, her and her children, I um, started to realize that the Department of Social Services Protective Services did not seem very knowledgeable. And they were not doing some of the things that anyone would think they would do. The two pediatricians, she had signed releases, contacted me and said, we have sent in um, the requested form which we call 3200 yep. that reports child abuse and no one has contacted us and I said no one's contacted me either and that really piqued my interest 
simultaneously, I had a client come in my office to see me personally who told me she had just left the Department of Social Services, and I asked her why. Uh, because she was a protective service worker. She said, because all I have is a high school degree and eight weeks of training. Mm -hmm. And I can't, she said, I don't feel qualified pulling children out of homes. It's terrible. I just cannot do it and live with myself. At that point, I decided to do follow-up to see how many of these protective services people that remove children actually had any kind of a license. Right. And so what I did is I contacted the man who was head of um, the family for the state, um, children and family. And um, through Freedom of Information, he gave me all the names of the people that work for the Department of Protective Services, Department of Human Services. And um, so what I did with about three or four other women, we looked them up, and what we found was absolutely scary to me. Because you'll see here that we went through the names of every single person and um, all of these in pink are people that have no licenses um, or special training other than the um, eight weeks that they were trained. Uh, some of them had like a college degree in history or something like that, or music. But you'll see page after page after page where they were not trained at all. Wow. Now that began to make sense to me. In fact, I summarized this up. This was in 2005 that um, Michigan had 116 county directors. 16 had any kind of a license whatsoever. 100 had no license whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Then I looked at the supervisors in Michigan. 200 and, or 615 of the supervisors, uh, 75 had a license, 540 had no license of any kind. Then I looked at what we call the caseworkers who now have begun to call themselves social workers. There were 5,393 caseworkers, 445 of them did have a license. 50 of those that were licensed were licensed as technicians only. But there were 4,948 caseworkers in Michigan that were unlicensed. Wow. At that point, I went to the State Board of Licensing and produced that information, and the State Board of Licensing decided to do nothing about it whatsoever. And so that really uh, began to occur to me that perhaps they were not going to do well or didn't do well in so many of these cases. My analogy was it was like having an orderly in the hospital just be renamed a doctor and have them start doing surgery. Right. It was about the same kind of thing, and it was very frightening to me. Right, because they don't have any training on children and trauma. Um, you know, anytime you've got a situation like this, you're gonna you're dealing with kids that have post-traumatic stress disorder, and that right. comes with a whole plethora of symptoms on its own. Mm -hmm. You know, you not even talking about the abuse. There's a lot there to deal right. with, and <clears throat> we need trained individuals to help these children heal, or they're not going to. And that's well, a huge issue. Right. A when you, big you, issue. You have the seven-year-old brother that was um, totally separate from the case of my daughters and, and the marriage, and he was pulled right into the case of the sexual abuse and um, put in under Judge Gardner when it was, you know, for how many years, seven years, totally separate with a different judge. And right. he's brought in like he's this child, this man's son, um, taken and given to a father that signed off his rights you know, after he um, disclosed not only witnessing the abuse of his sister, but this man also had sexually abused him. So he's taken, you know, two years later, two years after the abuse, 
taken from me and given to a man that had signed off. And that's not even us. legal if he signed off all parental no, rights. No, that's not no, legal. no, no, um, not at all. No. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't know how that would pertain to the. So, what what do you know about the children and? Who were they placed with and what took place after the fact? They Obviously, were placed with their, fa the their fathers. I had supervised visits for um, like three years. But you weren't the one that abused them? No, I, they could not, could not prove abuse or neglect in any way, shape, or form. And okay. then when we asked them to, sh to prove the abuse, because um, I'd been put on the central registry twice, twice they took me off the central registry without even a hearing. Okay, but just to clarify, this was, um, the kids had disclosed abuse, but yes. it was your ex that abused them, not right. you, you had nothing no. to do with that, and the minute you found out there was abuse, you moved to protect your children, yes. is that accurate? Yes. Okay, yes. so it would have had nothing to do with you other than the fact that you were trying desperately to protect your kids that you know, right. unfortunately had yes. um, been in some horrific abuse. I'd just like to comment here that in the preliminary hearing, um, I got a record of that, and the uh, magistrate said that it was her own fault that her children were removed They've come to, CPS has come to the conclusion after receiving 19 complaints that most of them alleging mistreatment of the children by their fathers. None of the complaints being substantiated as true. Therefore, the CPS investigation has convinced the petitioner that the mother, children's mother and others are explicitly coaching and pressuring the children to fabricate and parent allegations against their father and stepfather and that the children are subject to substantial risk of harm to their mental well-being if they continue in their mother's custody. Okay, but what happened to the evidence that the evidence the was never picked up? I carried the mattress. The vaginal cutting? I yes. Mean, Nothing. This Everything, it was, it was, it was never brought up or talked about in court. Ever. Ever. They were never, she was never allowed witnesses. So, just mm -hmm. to clarify, you are one of the people, you're a mandated reporter because of right. what you do. Right, right. I'm guessing. Right. So you were the one, one of the ones that put in, as you should have, um, a 3,200, right. Mm -hmm. That the children had yeah. indeed been abused. I sent in several of them. Now, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you, did, did Miss Cole threaten you and tell you you had to do that? Of course not. Okay. Absolutely untrue. No, she never and did that. she didn't push you to um, allege something that wasn't taking place? No, not at and all. this was directly from what the children said to you. Exactly. Now. I know that there are certain things that happen in forensic interviews, mm -hmm. and you've been educated in that. Mm -hmm. So can you give me some of the reasons why you believe the children, in fact, have been abused, and, and tell the general public what made what convinced you that these children were telling the truth about the abuse? Because that's kind of not everybody's trained, right? So I that's just want them to right. Know. Well, that's kind of separate from having taught school for years and know what children say. Right. In fact, I was um, in charge of preschool for the Grandpa's Public Schools for a while as a school social worker. Uh, and so, you know, you get, it's very hard for me to differentiate, except when I get something especially very solid, not only the children talking, but as when the little boy, after a few months he came back and he started to tell me, and I said, because I taught fourth grade and he was going into fourth, draw me a picture. And he drew me an exact picture of the scene. Oh, wow. So this is, when, when someone draws a picture of the scene 
from where he was standing, and he even told me what each person was saying. So I, in fact, wrote it down on the side of the picture what every person was saying. And um, I send it in, of course, right. again, because the bottom of the form always says, if you have additional information, send it in. Yeah. And I have it because it was returned to me with a letter saying, we've made up our mind. We don't need additional information. In fact, I had called them as I had through the years uh, when I was in the school saying, I'll be sending this in. Yeah. And I never had them say, don't send anything in. But when it came to this case, for some reason, they told me, don't send it in. I decided to send <coughs> it in anyway because I had no alternative. If I didn't send it in, they, w they could have done something legal to me, perhaps. Right. So oh, yeah. I You're did send it in. Yeah. Right, being yeah. mandated. Obligation to the exactly. kids. Not even, not even to Sharon, but to the kids. And right. Um, we here at Silent Voices like to emphasize that this isn't about the parents, even though right. you know, through it all we get hurt. Right. You know, it hurts to see our kids get hurt. Exactly. But it's really about the kids and what they go through. And to try to watch kids come back from a place that's so dark like that, mm -hmm. it, a lot of times it ends badly, like it did with my son and suicide. Yes, and it does. It's just, you know, at one point, and Sharon will tell you about this, having a son who had been signed off, never known his really birth father, put with him, with the birth father, who didn't want him. Mm -hmm. Who abused him. Abused him. For a, nine years. yes, um, a birth father who was already in trouble with the law for extortion, but when he got his son back, suddenly she had to pay child support. So he was getting oh, some yes, additional yes. monies in. And that child went into tremendous grief, but I wasn't allowed to see him, nor the others. They were placed with their father. So this is somebody that signed all rights off. So I'm going to take a little leap here and say that he was not bonded with the child mm -hmm. when the father was given custody. And this is a big mm -hmm. issue for kids. Mm -hmm. um, their primary caregiver and the primary you know person that they're bonded with is really significant in children's lives because that it's a sense of security for right. them and when that's taken from them it's really really devastating as your kids unfortunately have learned the hard way Sharon wow. will Sharon will sh share with you right now how she happened finally to hear back from her son when her son's friend's mother called her. Share that. Well, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna bring you back next segment. Okay. And right now, I just wanna, I, I wanna end this one, and I, we still got a lot more to talk about. Mm -hmm. So we will be back um, in just a few with part two. Thank you. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at mi parental rights at gmail.com that's mi parental rights at gmail.com and we'll be back right after this message
let's go to the Michigan for parental rights wall of shame right now. Angel Lane Place died on September 17th in Colorado after her foster mother, Sydney Danielle White, admitted accidentally dropping the 11 month old girl and shaking the child violently while holding her by the neck. Why did the infant girl end up in foster care? She had been taken from her biological parents by Mesa County Human Services because the girl's mother said the couple fought and Angel's father smoked marijuana. White told police that on September 15th, Angel went on a crying fit and would not stop. White then held Angel by the neck with both hands and shook her multiple times, according to the police. The 20-year-old, who described herself to police as out of control, shook the baby by the neck and wouldn't stop until one of her own children saw what she was doing and pleaded with her, Mommy, stop it. After the shaking incident, Angel Lynn Place went to sleep and would not wake up for her nap. She was rushed to a hospital, but was unresponsive. The baby was removed from life support on September 17th. Sydney Daniel White, you're on the Michigan for parental rights wall of shame. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the difference. difference.